Deep in the human unconscious is a pervasive need for a logical universe that makes sense. But the real universe is always one step beyond logic. The Interplanetary Podcast. The exploration of space for the benefit of all humankind. Your hosts here in North Devon, Matthew and George Russell. Oh yeah, baby Frank. June Herbert. Nice. (laughs) So yeah, why are we talking about June, George? Why are we talking about June? Well, Frank... June Herbert's uh, book has been made into a film for the second time in human history. Yeah, and we and we saw it last night, didn't we? Yeah, yeah, it was pretty good. What did you think of the film? What did you think of the film? I I'd say in m- almost all fields, it was uh, it was like at least a nine out of ten. Wow! Sound as des- sound design, score, and CGI, I put it like ten. Wow. Yeah, the sound design was absolutely brilliant. We 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 only saw it in a tiny little cinema in Barnstable, <laughs> which was was a bit annoying. I'm I'm definitely going to go see it at again. like a forty five degree angle as well. Yeah, yeah. You I'm, have to I, see it. In, you have to see it in IMAX because <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely going to go re see it in IMAX. But yeah, the sound was incredible. Sound design was incredible. The soundtrack was good. But I thought the CGI was absolutely mind blowingly good. Yeah. It was a good mix of um, practical and CGI, but things like the the physics simulations and of like the sand and and like things like that is just yeah really insane. Well, yeah. Well, tell us a little bit about the sand physics simulation then. Well, yeah, it's it's um probably one of the first instances ever of of this of, if this thing called f- fluidization, which mm-hmm. happens in any kind of you know particle like sand or just, yeah just any any kind of particles where you have either like high vibrations, like let's say a giant space worm were to be, you know, going through the sand, for example, or like if you have air being pushed upwards, then the sand acts like a fluid. Mm-hmm. So I've, I've seen that there's a video on YouTube of a guy that, uh, you know, has, get, gets a pool of sand and has air uh, blown up in, into the sand and actually acts like he, you, know, you can swim in, in the sand and things like that. Uh, but, but it's used as a plot device in the latest film. That the the giant worm swimming through the sand, I suppose, because I always used to think that that's not possible, but maybe it is. Maybe maybe Frank Herbert wasn't being like a numpty. I mean, maybe. real real worms can swim through soil. soil. <laughs> yeah, but they don't kind of move fast, do they? They don't they don't move like a, a whale or a sea snake through water. Yeah, but I guess fast is relative. Like to to you know, like if mm. if humans were were as small as humans are compared to hmm. but these sandworms i suppose are vibrating the sand so that the sand does become a fluid so that they can swim through it yeah and i really like that it's a bit i tell you what it reminds me of we, we used to do a, an experiment in, at salford university called the kunt tube which was a a tube of vibrating sand that you could see the sound wave in once you oscillated the sound wave at a certain frequency you could see the sine wave in sand nice in the cunt tube <laughs> with much much hilar- m- much laughing of course in the in the in the lecture hall uh, <laughs> i don't know why but uh, you know it's a joke that went over my head um <laughs> george what else what else did you really like anything else good in the film um i mean uh, we've already mentioned the sound design uh yeah it's, it's pretty pretty epic mm. and the, and the music's epic and as well. you know hans zimmer he, he never misses no but the the cgi of all the spaceships and stuff very similar to arrival i thought yeah but then yeah it's the same director i guess yeah all, all like the you know all of the vehicles and things mm. look really really good especially the obviously the dragonfly inspired hmm so anyway, one of the reasons, one of the things that you said to me when I said, let's record a podcast, and you said, yeah, let's do human evolution, human divergent evolution with giant kind of timelines, like, because June's kind of 10,000 years in the future, isn't it? Yeah, the idea would be like, what what do humans look like in, in 10,000 years? Is is there, or do we all look, you know, are we all one species still? Is, are we still even humans? Uh, and also, and more importantly, you know, is there a different species of human? Have, have we diverged from a common yeah. ancestor? So, because that's 
it's it's really cleverly done in June. And it's one of those things that as I was watching it, because I knew it was cleverly done in June, the film, I think, does it better than the original film, the David Lynch film. We should mention the David Lynch film because I actually love the David Lynch film. You weren't a big fan, were you, George? Uh, it's The problem with it is <laughs> it's quite un- hard to understand what, what is going on. Well, that's because, I mean... He does cover the entire book in the one film. Yeah. And so he does do it. So he moves, he feels, it goes very fast. It does feel a bit rushed. But um, that, that that film, the the effort put into mm. into it is just insane. Like, for, like nowadays, you know, like shots you can do with CGI and things like pr- relatively pretty quickly. But with this, the, the you know, the old version of June, the David Lynch version, the the scene where the the two the two are fighting um mm-hmm. with they're the pra- shield they're practice fighting yeah 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 the, the the practice fighting using shields and like swords that you know don't cut but but they but the, on every frame not only did they have to draw on the shields on every frame but they had to have separate bits of film for each individual face on the, on those shields so they're like you know, like maybe ten or so polygons on on their shield, <laughs> oh and they're gosh. and they're hand drawing each one. I'm like, because cr- cr- back then they didn't have computers, so you couldn't just put like a blur effect on. So they had to actually like, you know, have that blur effect on each face practically. Mm. Oh God, yeah. I mean, well, I guess that's it. I mean, I love David Lynch; he's one of my favorite directors. But I, I mean, this this Dune is is definitely a quantum leap above. David Lynch's version, even though it pains me to say it, because I do love the David Lynch version. Oh, it's like but four it, generations of filmmaking. Ahead. Yeah, but I suppose it's it, the but the story is really good, and that's the the bit that I wanted to get the bit I want to talk about, which is the bit that you mentioned, which which because it, it's the first thing we talked about on the bus where where people were referred to as humans, but all the humans were slightly different. Yeah, they don't seem different enough to really be considered even a different like at all a different genus. Yeah, right? but. But but that's the same on Earth, isn't it? If you if you if you well, we're not we know you know like every p- little pockets of population around the Earth, we we you know we we're, we're no different, are we? That the 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 changes are absolutely minimal in terms of genetics. Yeah, yeah. There's there's well, even in terms of characteristics, like like all the same psychological and health problems are with Australian Aborigines as they would be with. You know, you you know Western Europeans or or South Americans or the Incas or whatever. Yeah. You know, we, we, we're pockets of population, but you can definitely tell the difference between those pockets of population, and they haven't been isolated for that long, but certainly thousands of years to, to sort of build those traits to have those. Yeah, generations. thousands, thousands of years, but that's not that's like you're barely scratching at a, a, like a new species. Yes, I know, but so. Why Frank Herbert's really clever is it isn't just about because now we're sort of entering. There's kind of three different ways that you could be talking about. We should just just for those. I, I don't want to spoil the film for anyone because the plot is really really good. But we should kind of do some kind of background to this film, right? Because I think it's important. It's it's basically set in the future, <laughs> obviously. Not like Star Wars. <laughs> not not like Star Wars is set in the in the long distant past, but it, it's set in the future where humans have gone out and populated the galaxy, haven't they? So they they've yeah. populated the galaxy and they're on different planets. And as a result, um these different planets may have different factions. But what's but what's really clever about it is that it's it's done in a kind of feudal system. So you've got this massive emperor who rules the galaxy essentially, and there's one religion, but it's but it's but there's lots of different houses and yeah, fiefdoms. The three main houses. Yeah, but there's fiefdoms as well. So you've got these planets that are kind of so it's, so it's based on a kind of feudal system, um, and. One of the reasons why he did that is because he wanted to because well, well I mean there's a there's another overarching kind of arc of politics and religion, but also this overriding arc of uh, ecology as well, which I think is extremely timely because things like resources and yeah and resource other yeah and themes. the way that those resources push you in a certain direction, which has got to do with this human divergence, which is one of the clever really clever plot points that he's Herbert's interested in. So before he wrote Dune, get this, like Herbert actually after his first site uh, after his first novel, he went off and studied 
uh, sand dunes in Oregon. And what they were doing in Oregon was trying to stop the sand dunes from swallowing cities and lakes and rivers and highways, as he put it. Um, and and they did this by growing grasses and things like that that would hold back the, the dunes and, and kind of keep it all together to stop the the sand storms and everything spreading like you know almost like a disease the sand yeah. like a cancer that spreads it's like they're the at war with the sand yeah it's like they're at war with the sand in oregon so so he was so he was writing about that and his article was called they stopped the moving sands and but it never got published even though i think it's being republished now as something like the road to dune or something like that but so he was also interested in messiahs and and superheroes and then realized that a lot of these major religions had sort of sprung up out of places which were desert style places like if you you know you think like Jesus and and yeah, Muhammad and the, you know they, they, these people sprung up out of these crazy um you know crazy places where resources are very very minimal and you're you're sort of scraping a living and it even he based it on uh, Lawrence of Arabia so so the actual original kind of idea was very Lawrence of Arabia but he decided to make it way more complicated and add loads more layers to the story yeah it's, it became- one, it's one of those stories that really is like really thick law that you have to kind of understand it yeah but actually i guess there's certain things in there that once you understand where it, the, the background of it, they, they start to become, because you think it's crazy at first, but then you think maybe it's not so crazy because he's he's really thought about certain things. I mean, the really big one in there is this thing called the spice. And the spice is, spice comes from the fact that he was actually experimenting with magic mushrooms. <laughs> and magic mushrooms obviously have these spores that go up into the air. And, and that's a theme in the, that's a theme in the um, film where the main character is, is they think he's allergic to the spores in the air, but it's giving him visions, you know, Hey, Hey, magic mushrooms. Um, and so, but the, so that, that you've got the magic spice, the spores, you've got the giant sandworms that represent the maggots that digest the mushrooms and are part of the life cycle of the mushrooms, not to spoil the film there. And of course, the eyes of the Fremen, the Fremen are these indigenous people that eat the spice. Um, they have really blue eyes and so do the mushrooms, uh, so do magic mushrooms are very, very blue um uh so you know there's there's a sort of blue in the mushroom so he's he so basically are their eyes blue because they take lots of spice or is it just because this is that's just like genetics like the evolution uh both isn't it i think so so they've they've been taking lots of spice so their eyes are blue but because of their generations of it their eyes are bluer <laughs> right so yeah i think you know so but it, you know it's it, what frank herbert is very implicit in the book See, this is where books actually have the advantage over films. In the books, I believe, he really points out this idea of people having natural evolution on different planets. So that there's a, you know, the driver of the normal driver of evolution being uh, the fight for resources and stuff. So the people of this desert that live on this desert planet, Arrakis, yeah, they the Fremen as they're called, they do things like if you cut them. They their bleeding stops very very quickly. In other words, they have you know they they heal extremely quickly. The because blood, those who didn't died. Yeah, those who didn't die because you lose too much moisture. So they're very you know so their bodies have evolved to to you know to keep, hold on to moisture as much as possible. But they also design their suits. Now, of course, in modern times, there's kind of like two different beliefs about human evolution. So one is that we've kind of reached a dead end <laughs> with human evolution, that somehow, you know, we're the culmination of three and a half billion years of biological evolution. And we're the kind of epitome of all the millions and millions and millions of mutations and adaptations. And so some people refer to us as the kind of magnus opus of Mother Nature. Well, I think we- there's another point you can make there is that you know, but since we've invented hospitals, yeah, and and things like that, it's like even if there's something wrong with you, and you have either a, like a genetic problem which causes you to mm. lose a limb or something like that, you're still not really that much more likely to die because there's people to take care of you. So evolution's kind of been hindered by that fact. Yeah. So so lots of people believe. Yeah. Lots of lots of people believe that we've stopped 
evolving as a result because there is there's no longer there's no longer selective the pressure selective pressure you know it you know because you've got housing and food production and stuff like that which are all incredibly you know the, the more we live in luxury the less of a driver there is for evolution yeah. and if you think about premature deaths as well like most of it's just random like it's just like getting run over or <laughs> yeah. Yeah, or like you know just like it's just random illnesses they're not really ge- like because of genetics mm. necessarily well and annoyingly human intelligence for example there doesn't seem to be a mechanism for that to become necessarily a driver of evolution for example it's not like women suddenly found einstein really really attractive or men found marie curie really really attractive because she was really clever and wanted to have lots of knots of offspring with them yeah so 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 like intelligence isn't necessarily a thing and i can't help feeling that that if you have a society that lives in in like a, a lap the lap of luxury like you would imagine say a society living on an O'Neill cylinder where everything's provided yeah, and AI automated. looks after you, then, then presumably mutations are more likely to make you thicker than cleverer. <laughs> oh, of course. Uh, and also, like, if there's no if there's no selective pressure to... Like, if, if, if there's a culture of just just not really caring about intelligence or even thinking that it's, like, worthless, you, you, you definitely don't have that selective pressure. Like, you, and almost it's almost the opposite. Hmm. It's like a culture that doesn't care about intellect. Just, yeah. just actually, there's like it goes the other way. Yeah, you start so, becoming dumber. So technology. So this is something that Frank Herbert must have realized. He must have realized that technology kind of maybe stalls human evolution. But he wanted to explore this idea that of divergent human evolution. Right. So he he came up with this premise in the book that um, that that machines had become that that like robots and and computers had become a threat to um to them right so it, it, there's a quote in there that goes once men turned their thinking over to machines in the hope that this would set them free but they only permitted other men and machines to enslave them so it was the whole the whole idea that machines basically had become the keeper of men, and so they they had this great revolution, a jihad, a machine jihad, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, where they basically decided, I think it's called the Butlerian jihad, where mankind waged war against the machines, and so all computing devices were banned throughout the galaxy, which which means that now humans themselves are being forced into schooling in logic and reasoning and 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 made cleverer and clef- cleverer so yeah using genetic modification to essentially turn people yeah. into walking computers yeah so it, it so that it so it forced human minds to develop and 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 that so like in the film you see some of the, some of the characters walking around that are moving hum, human computers yeah they right? can look up and look like yeah the eyes go white yeah and they and then they're computing things and then yeah, so that that's a clever thing in itself. So it's it's basically saying, yeah, maybe one thing we could maybe people think that technology has hindered our evolution, but it might be that technology is just a a little bump in a, in in our evolution. So that at the moment, yes, humans have stalled a little bit because technology is kind of uh, just there as a as a sort of stopgap almost for where we're going to go next. And of course, um, machines themselves are evolving. Like you could call like the way that the computers get better and better and evolution and the AI gets better and better and particularly machine learning. Well, it's not, it's not really evolution in the sense that it's not like it, occur, it recurs. It's more like that is more like just design. Hmm. It, like the designs are getting better, but that's not, it would only be really count as evolution if, if it were being, if the designs of computers were being automated by like some kind of simulated evolution. Hmm. So I I like the fact that that that's one of the things that he's set up. He's set it up set up this idea that yes there's machines te- there's technological evolution but he's managed to get rid of that influence on humans by 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 basically saying there would be a revolt against it. And that's actually a common theme like they do I think they do it in Star Trek as well. And of course it might be what's happened in star wars as well because star wars doesn't have like ridiculous computers in it any uh, either but they have obviously mega advanced technology yeah, i always think maybe humans are like if you were to take all the sentient or the sapient mm. beings in the in the galaxy humans are just like 
the one one thing that we're really good at compared to everything else are computers. So if you go if you go to another s- civilization, maybe they've got like Commodore sixty fours, but they've <laughs> but they've invented interstellar travel. Yeah, but 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 you can't help feeling that that let's face it, things like interstellar travel are going to be a hell of a lot easier to work out all the maths when you've got computers and like like insane computing power. Yeah, but, but they but they might have like because because there are anim- like funguses and things that can compute things like like the 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 postman. What what is is that the maths problem? The postman problem or the. Yeah, the traveling salesman. Tra- traveling salesman. The traveling yeah, yeah. salesman problem. Yeah, you can, can solve using... with with bubbles as well. Is one yeah. of the things. Yeah. So. so that maybe they have like a tree on their planet that just like <laughs> does maths or something. Yeah, you can stir strands of DNA to solve some of those. Yeah, I can't remember what they're called. NP and cellular automata as well. Yeah, cellular automata. Maybe they have yeah. just like a naturally occurring one they can use. No, so so not only do you have this natural evolution, and and one of the things is is like putting different species of of humans well no different pockets different populations of humans on different planets and seeing how they evolve so like the different uh the house of harkan and or whatever they're called they become super aggressive as a as a as a species and so they're much bigger and they're that they, you know they are much much kind of scarier as a as a species i guess all that all that would need to happen is is just if a culture valued like strength and, and war hardiness well if that if that's the way that they survive it could just be from uh, just selection uh you know mm. the, the other really cool thing they have in dune is guided evolution which i think actually we've already entered the technological paradigm of guided evolution so this is this idea that you can genetically modify people with a with a goal in mind so you sort of say well we're sending people to mars so let's genetically modify them so they can withstand the cold they're more resistant to radiation their bones won't go brittle and they won't lose body mass because of the lack of gravity and we can do this using crispr style technologies and actually genet you know deliberately genetically modified guide guide the evolution of 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 human beings so that we become so you know we really do start sort of splitting off and become homo martian rather yeah, so you're than not just homo waiting, you're not waiting for these kind of adap- adaptations to happen you're just you're just doing you're just jumping straight to the end with yeah it. yeah and and of course that's that's also in june as well the um so the bene gesserit um are are a sort of religious cult who have been guiding evolution by by basically pairing humans off, so they're sort of treating them like cattle almost. Uh, yeah, and, so like in the same way we select, we've been selecting crops and yeah. dogs and things. They've just been with humans. Yeah, so they've been doing the same thing, you know, mixing bloodlines, because the spice has revealed that humans have this capability of seeing into the future. Because the spice is the only way people can navigate the galaxy because you have to have an awareness of space and time to be able to navigate because at light computers, speeds. Yeah, so. because they don't have computers, yeah. Um but I know I think it's even it's even beyond that as well that that even a computer can't do what a human mind can do once it's been affected by 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 the spice. Uh, you know, I mean, it's a, a, I mean, I have to say, I thought that's obviously the most outlandish element. Yeah, it's definitely of the, plot. The, the very far, <laughs> very far from what you know reality is. But yeah, but I suppose that's that's how he that's how he explores the idea of human divergence. He ha- he has to have a mechanism for humans to yeah, populate. I guess it's it's, it's just galaxy, like the force. In Star Wars, it's just like well, an extra like bit of yeah, well, spice. It, well, to... well, it's like the warp drive in Star Trek, or the or even the teleportation device in Star Trek. It's it's a way of just getting moving, around yeah, problems, yeah getting, yeah, getting around the fact that there is no way to do interstellar travel. Well, I guess warp warp drives actually are being looked at seriously by NASA. I know, but unlike taking mash- magic mushrooms to, <laughs> to plot courses, <laughs> that... but, but no, you'd be surprised. I mean, there was. I heard a I heard this ridiculous thing about this man feeding LSD to dolphins because he was and and this was a government this was a government approved uh, research under Trump 
No, no, this is like obviously back in the 60s oh, where, okay. where 60s, everyone was, yeah. yeah, back when this book was written. So you can kind of see the background of the 60s where the, where it was the um this bloke was giving dolphins LSD because he thought that dolphins were in communication with aliens. And of therefore therefore if you give them LSD they should be able to talk to us. Because if I was an alien, <laughs> the first people I <laughs> first people I talk to is dolphins. Dol- yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it makes it, sense. Yeah, it's it's mad, isn't it? So, I that whole idea. Uh, what I like about it is that the whole idea that humans couldn't evolve anymore, I think, is is kind of slightly blown apart by if we were able to do interstellar travel and start populating other worlds. If you start thinking about it even more deeply. What happens when people return from those places? So you you might have like a pilgrimage of people from a distant planet that you've sent out that have evolved. And when they come back to Earth, they, they, they would almost seem like alien species because they'd be so different from the indigenous people on Earth. Like the truth is probably a mixture of the two. We've reached a dead end, but also we will continue to evolve in the sense that like right now evolution stopped. And probably it will be stopped for the next a thousand years or so, or whenever we dis- whenever we start colonizing uh, the galaxy. But as soon as we do that, then we'll start uh, evolving and like di- have it having divergent evolution. Yeah, I mean, you say we've stopped evolving, but of course there was that very controversial thing that happened a few years ago where the Chinese, where a Chinese scientist basically used CRISPR to alter the genetics of two unborn twins who whose parents had AIDS or HIV and uh, to, to give them that immunity to HIV. Um, and, of course, you know, everyone... It shocked the world because, obviously, you're not really... Well, you're definitely... There's, there's a whole heap of moral problems with it. But he has... He has forever change the human race if if those children go on to have offspring and then eventually that that kind of bloodline will have will have gone through worked its way through the entire species and so that one that one single act of using crispr has in some real sense made the human race evolve ever so slightly yeah so but i mean i guess it's not stri- strictly speaking altering genetics like manually isn't really evolution well no it's guided evolution isn't it so it's basically saying no but you that's know, more like selective breeding it's not i don't even it's, it's not really evolution it's just no, like no, it's just no. like creating a no 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 it's not it's not evolution by natural selection but it is it, evolution means that something has evolved into something else right so so it, it would be evolution so you've got this idea that um you know just because you're not doing it through natural selection doesn't doesn't mean that it's not a it's not an evolution i mean one of the one of the really interesting things is we we may even get to a point where we're no longer doing sexual reproduction like sexual reproduction obviously has been how things have evolved mainly on on planet earth for like a few billion years yeah well you know it's one of the that, that's the driver and it and it's it but imagine a time where you've got AIs that are matching. So say if you have a, a two parents and they say, we want a child, instead of randomly <laughs> going 50% of your genetics mixed with 50% of yours yeah. and just randomly doing it, you have an AI that matches up the DNA to give you the best possible child. Then, uh, And then you have AI parents that bring them up because it's likely that like AIs would do a better job than most parents. It seems, sounds like a lot like a dystopia. <laughs> but, it, but also there's no limit on how many parents. I mean, two is good because you because you can avoid hmm. getting bad genes from both because the likelihoods of them both having a bad gene, provided they're not related, is quite low. But, I mean, if you have three, four, then you're even less likely to have genetic problems. Hmm. Well, yeah. And well, I mean, you can definitely with CRISPR make sure that you don't have any of these horrible... You don't even need that. You just... Inherited genetic diseases. If you can have this AI like picking genes from which parent, you you know, you could could have a database of millions of of humans to genetics and select from that. 
No, no, but but it, but people are vain enough and, and arrogant enough that they want to be it to be half their genetics. But, you know what I mean? but they're chill with the uh, the AI raising that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that, but that, but that, I mean that's the thing is like you know when people want a child they they kind of want themselves to go on, which which of course leads to this other thing of like of of evolution really stopping, like having no pressure because someone as arrogant as me might go, do you know what? I was pretty perfect. So my child is just going to be a reprint <laughs> of my clone. genetics. Yeah. Well, yeah, they have looked into like a bone marrow, you know, people being able to just like have a clone child of themselves. Oh God. And and so, yeah, that would, you know, massively change things. But there's some other, there's, there's other really interesting ones. Like imagine generation ships, you know, this whole idea that interstellar travel is ridiculously difficult and it takes many generations to travel even to close stars. So why not have a ship that basically takes generations to get somewhere? A generation ship. A generation ship. So you've got lots of people on this ship. But just like when populations move to an island and you get very very quickly you get rapid divergence of their of that of of those people so like the aborigines or the uh, you know look very very different because they were you know they were isolated but not for very long um but they, but they have very different you know they they look very different and have different traits and um and are maybe susceptible to certain illnesses or you know etc cetera, etc cetera. That, that, that the other populations aren't. So generation ships actually, just the fact that they've got this low population might actually be a source of human divergence as well. So by the time they actually get to populate one of these planets, they've already diverged considerably from the original, you know, So, but, but in a kind of almost random yeah, way. See, at the speed of even our fastest spacecrafts, you're still you're looking at like even the closest stars well, thousands, thousands of, years. of years yeah yeah so thousands of years to get there so it's it's likely that that, that even then <laughs> you you you've got quite a lot of uh, uh divergence but i it, the crazy thing is we we haven't even we haven't even taken into consideration things like cybernetics or transhumanism where not only could humans evolve biologically but we may sort of merge with our technology as well also um another another thing is like if ais decide to give themselves genetics to have evolution running like in the background hmm. are, are they if are they considered like descendants of humans or are they a new like source of life yeah well this is i mean that's that's a really interesting one yeah is is a is an ai if it gets to a certain point does it have human rights well, oh, I mean, that's another thing as well. Like, I, I guess if it is say, sentient, like, because because there already are computers with with the necessary computing power to run a human brain. Hmm. In in China, has one that is like slightly above that of a human brain. So so now it's just a matter of software. Oh, yeah. See, see, I I think Frank, I think that Dune did itself a real favor by sort of cutting out that that kind of technology because it i think that well, it implies that, it at least well well, well he's yeah well no he, he well but he's he, he's quite explicit that there yeah, was a yeah. jihad against it so that you didn't so that you don't muddy the water with all these other elements but because they were already thinking about things like the matrix even back, but it seems back it then. seems unlikely that you would be able to beat like an army of ais like if ai got <laughs> like because it's if it's like a hundred times as intelligent as human and it's made millions of copies of itself. And it's just on the internet and like mm. can control just any factory and anything. Mm. It feels like it just feels impossible that you could you could really beat an AI that got out of hand. Yeah, well, an AI of course could be the black box black ball of inventions. But it but it also could be <laughs> the annoying thing about AI is like it could also be really good at the same time as being also being really bad. Hmm. Well, yes, that's why it's a black. That's why it's a black ball of technology, or maybe a grey ball of technology. Yeah. Where it's like it, but black balls just like antimatter nukes for free. Yeah. Well, but yeah, but uh, an AI, uh, uh, an unstoppable AI, is a black ball technology, isn't it? As in, it's it's over, it's gain, it's existential yeah. for the human species. It would be like if ants could somehow overthrow humans. 
you know, it's just like you're you're dealing with like levels of intelligence <laughs> that are exponentially getting more more and more bigger as it improves itself. Mm. Yeah, I mean, uh, of course, there's this other idea that humans could upload themselves I- into something like the Matrix, and then you've got things like hive minds and stuff like that. And evolution uh, at that point is just like character like customization. Yeah, that's dealt with. Re- I, I, I rewatched a film called Her recently. And that's, it's done really well in that, the idea of AIs sort of clubbing together and, and becoming just way beyond where we're at now, but then being very, very sentient and even in love with their human counterparts and stuff like that, And but moving beyond love and kind of... It's really, really good. It's a really good film. I recommend that as well because that deals with that element of it. It's a bit like uh, the, the film um, Ex Machina. Yeah, a little bit like that. It's 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 my, it's my, in my opinion, I think hers a lot better than Ex Machina. Although I, I do, I mean, Ex Machina is obviously really, really uh, cool as well. Concept. Yeah, that is a really good film for like uh, like low budget film. That is that's probably one of the best. Is it that low budget? I mean, I imagine so. Like, it's got two actors or three <laughs> like three or so actors, and yeah, but it's it's pretty good CGI. Um. That's pretty cheap nowadays, though. Yeah, that's true. You just need, like, one artist from yeah. some, like, really low pay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so so I I just thought it was worth having a look at that. I thought that, that it was the first thing that we thought about, wasn't it, when we came out of the cinema and when we were talking about June. And, I, and it's kind of, it's such a subplot, isn't it, that whole idea that there's these, that really it's kind of humans against humans, but yeah, they've kind the of prob- gone down. The problem down. is they're not really that different enough. Like I, Like, I feel like they're just too similar to to really consider themselves like a different species because not having hair isn't exactly the the biggest <laughs> <laughs> like some some humans already don't have hair no but there are some there's some massive big big differences for example the the sort of cult that the the Benny Gesserit they've they've managed to sort of they've got special powers <laughs> they've got like telekinesis and yeah that's and, from like spice and stuff no, it's not. No, no, that that's that that's kind of they've developed beyond that. That's not from spice. Oh yeah, but, from the, but, from but the... the use of spice is the navigators mm. can use spice, but they they're trying to use their powers and the navigators. They're trying powers. to like naturally breed themselves yeah. to not need spice to have those powers. Yeah. So, or, well, no, they're trying to breed like the ultimate human that that, yeah. that guides them to the, the said next. Sadarak. Yeah, the said Sadarak who, who who drives who who is the next sort of big step in human evolution that's what that's what they're trying to do yeah i guess religious sect but i mean like the others aren't that exactly that distinct from humans Mm. well it's i i reckon that 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 dune definitely worth go going seeing it and i think it's dune is definitely one of those books that's influenced sci-fi probably more than any other it's it's one of the biggest if not the biggest selling sci-fi book of all time it's yeah there's so much star wars in it well, well, like the it, emperor and yeah, well, exactly. I mean, Star Wars is kind of Dune light, <laughs> but which which is what we were saying is Dune going to be the next big trilogy after you know like Star oh, it, Wars? I and think Marvel. it. I think it will. You be. think it? I don't think it will be because it doesn't have. I think it's too complicated. I think it's too it's too deep. <laughs> yeah, but Whereas like Star Wars is you can deep, you can just watch but... it and just like enjoy the co- the cool explosions and mm, stuff. Yeah, but it's. It's, it's, watch it like a fast and furious film yeah it's missing the it's missing the slightly simpler love stories and and uh i don't know star wars is very is is a lot more simplistic and a lot a lot sort of yeah it's like a pop song versus a like jazz fusion a jazz fusion t- 20 minute long jazz fusion song yeah yeah and you thinking that that, that jazz fusion song is going to be the next number one single not sure you're right um, here's an it would be in the 80s. Uh, here's an interesting fact about Dune. So since 2009, all the um, planes and features of Titan, Saturn's moon Titan, yeah, uh, are named after the planets from the Dune novels. It's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy in a way. <laughs> what? It's like well, imagine no. if we found a, you know, like a planet and we just called it Arrakis just for fun. And and it turned out to be really sandy and had massive worms. Yeah. And 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 ridiculous magic mushrooms that were able to make like you bend a space drug and time. That like yeah, just, just. Um, mycologists are kind of influential on on the way that we see sci-fi. But you know, I think the last season of Star Trek was obsessed with 
the the mycelium network and things like that, which was some kind of way of navigating space. Yeah, mushrooms well. are really <laughs> kind of crazy. If you like, yeah, there's so many, uh, yeah, things. Uh, so if you get magic mushrooms, you mix them with Lawrence of Lawrence of Arabia, bung in a bit of um, messi- messianic uh, religions, and think deeply about human divergence, and you have for yourself the plot of Dune. Nice. <laughs> and also don't forget the worms and don't forget the worms so george what are you uh thinking of doing this week probably like revising for mocks and oh, doing mocks doing mocks i just came in and you were doing a, a cgi yeah version. i was i was recreating uh some cgi from the latest uh from from june <laughs> So, from the latest uh well, tell me about this film june the, this thing, oh no we just have done that's yeah what yeah been doing. Right, this yeah. film i don't know if you've heard it. it's um <laughs> oh this has been a very why don't we, why don't we talk about it <laughs> this has been a very silly episode it has but I, I you know i thought it'd be a nice light change from you know rockets and science just to have a chat about a little sci-fi film so if you haven't gone if you haven't seen june yet go see it go see yeah. it at the imax if though, you I have think. watched like the french dispatch or something <laughs> okay um yeah i prefer i i uh, definitely enjoyed it more than i did ad astra anyway which is now on uh on amazon prime i believe if you want to go watch that um i'm afraid that's it george i'm gonna say bye bye to the spodcats i'm not bye! i'm just gonna stay here bye spodcats you're just gonna stay here I'm talking just gonna stay, to yeah okay okay well, well i'll leave you with george okay yeah <laughs> goodbye <laughs> bye bye spodcats